All right. Wade T. Lightheart, welcome to the show. Great to be here, ladies. Thanks for having me. So yeah, excited we're so to have excited. You. <laughs> we are thrilled to have a fellow biohacker on the show today. You have had an incredible journey of health optimization using biohacking techniques and practice intuition. We really bonded over that before. Mm -hmm. You're a three-time Canadian all-natural bodybuilding champion, incredible, an optimized vegetarian. You're an amazing podcast host, amazing guy all around. And we had the pleasure of being on your show recently, so we're so excited we get to talk to you again so soon. So we want to hear all about your journey, but I think we'd like to start with this epidemic of poor digestion and nutrient depletion that we're seeing Yep. all over the place. We consider you an expert in this field. So where do you want to start? What is important to know about your journey and how can we fix the stuff that's going on? Well, there's a, 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 there's a variety of problems that are happening in an epidemic of, of digestive issues. So the, all the medical, whatever references you want to go to say, says that about a third of the population in the United States which is where most of the research is done, is suffering from digestive health problems on any given day, okay? It's 100 million people basically a day are having, and, and it, that can be anything from, you know, black, go, bloating, gas, acid reflux, heartburn, constipation, diarrhea, feeling, uh, I ate something bad. All of that is indicative that something's wrong. And- what the problem fundamentally facing us as people addressing our dietary needs or wanting to is number one, we don't understand our digestive systems, how they work and what are the important components of that or where we could troubleshoot issues. But there's a deeper issue and that is not understanding what has happened to our food supply over the last 80 years. And that is fundamentally where the problem lies. So if I'm in this mentality of treating the symptoms of my dietary choices, I never get to root cause. And the root cause is in the 1940s, after we dropped the nuclear bomb and the war ended, there was a massive explosion in the population called the baby boomers. And food production, uh, which was largely rural and farming oriented, most people had gardens and farms and worked on farms. And you can ask all your grandparents, almost of them know that worked in that situation at some point. I think it was 98% of the people at the turn of the century were working on a farm and now it's less than 2%. We, they all moved to the cities and out came this idea of we, the government start to realize like, how are we going to feed all these people? So they put together government regulation boards. They got really into, you know, okay, we need this much wheat. We need this much corn. We need this much, all the staple foods. And then because, you know, people started to concentrate in cities, we had to do mass production, mass distribution, mass preservation of these foods. We had to change our growing cycle and we moved from crop rotation into factory farming. And what happened and you know, the advent of technology and machines and things like that. So the giant wheat fields of the Midwest or corn fields and stuff, we started to happen and we got into agribusiness and agribusiness started to focus on how do we increase the yield, the volume of products we were pro producing without concentrating on what was actually in the food and what was actually on the food. And the, we eat food, not just for protein, fats, carbohydrates, and a little bit of fiber. We have nutrients, which are phytonutrients, minerals, vitamins, um, bacteria culture, enzymatic components. All of these things are factors that make food good for us or not good for us. And most of that was stripped away in how we identified what food was. Then we had the um, lobbyist groups, which were suggesting to get different types of food into the, into the uh, food chain. And, and then, of course, we're trying to meet the supply demands. And so over the course of this, we started to implement a lot of different things to increase yield and distribution of the food. 
that included adding leftover nitrogen from the bombs of World War II. So as we had gone to nuclear bombs, we had all this nitrogen bombs. Oh, well, if we put nitrogen on the soil, aka fertilizer, we can now increase the speed and the volume of food that we produce. It might be have less nutrients, but that wasn't being measured. Okay, because you increase the, 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 the speed of the development of the food, but you lose something out of it, particularly enzymes and bacteria cultures. Well, the food started to get problems and it started getting diseases or became susceptible to bugs because the food was weaker. It had a, it, essentially, the plants had a weakened immune system and so they become more susceptible. So then we said, okay, well, let's come up with herbicides and pesticides and fungicides. And when then they started to fail as the bugs started to adjust, because anytime you, you, you try to eliminate a species on the planet, there's a certain amount of these species which will mutate. We know this from bacteria cultures, right? If we take antibiotics, you don't take to the end of the antibiotics and some of these become resistance. And now hospitals are some of the most dangerous places because they have all these antibiotic resistant bacteria cultures. It's a huge issue in the medical industry. It's a huge issue in the farm issue. Probably going to be a huge issue in the, re in the current situation with the implications that's happening on the worldwide. We won't get into all the things. We don't want to get canceled. Because God help us if we applied a little bit of forethought to big problems. So... When we started to add all these chemicals to the food and everything, then it, they went into genetic modification of food. Well, let's make these new specialized strains, these new resistant strains, these, and all of these agents add it to uh, the things that our bodies had to digest, metabolize, and use. And we have a symbiotic relationship between the bacteria in our intestines and how they convert the food into the building blocks and energy units inside our bodies. And the bacteria is kind of like the last stage of digestion. We have chewing and we have enzymes that break things down and hydrochloric acid. But at the end of the day, we need to feed the bacteria so they can make the polypeptide chains to make us happy, to make us have energy, to fight off you know, pathogens. And when we add all these chemicals and we add foods that they can't understand, and we add drugs to deal with the, the agents that we can't do, we, we disrupt our intestinal area so much so that we can now not digest a variety of foods. And that starts off as allergies and inflammatory responses and low immune systems and depression and anxiety and skin conditions and all of these things, which we, we call the diseases of, of, of rapid technological technical uh, innovation or civilization can all be traced to the, the, the rapid change in our diet. And the damage has become so uh, prolific in our society that now we have created what I call dietary tribalism. Because maybe you grew up in the Midwest and were exposed to uh, a, an incredible amount of um, chemicals that disrupted the, your proteolytic enzymes, for example. I'm just using this as an example. Well, guess what? Now, when you eat certain types of protein or you see, eat something with gluten in it, you, you get an inflammatory response or you get depressed or you can't make the, and, well, why is that? Well, because you've damaged the bacteria, you've disrupted the enzyme pathway for that pathogen, or you've added a chemical agent, which has, puts a huge enzymatic load on your liver and now you can't metabolize it. And then so you go to the doctor and they give you some sort of drug or some sort of agent to, that, that masks the problem, but then creates another set of problems. And so we, we, this first started to emerge in milk and lactase, which is the enzyme that breaks down milk, became an issue. And then you started to see gluten is another one that's come in. And then we see people who can't metabolize carbohydrates anymore because we eat so many refined carbohydrates. So they can't handle amylase, or you have people who are getting their gallbladders out because they can't metabolize fats, which is lipase, or they're dealing with uh, neurochemical imbalances because they're not able to extract the amino acids from the protein they're eating and make the polypeptide chains that make our neurochemicals. And so what looks like all of these problems downstream, the hundred million problems a day, literally, that is coming out in, our in, 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 in these people reporting digestive issues, 
vary from all of these potential problems. And so what happens, it becomes very hard for the individual to determine, well, what's wrong with me? No one else is like this in my family. And what they're not aware of is there's so many downstream issues that could be here, unless you have a deep understanding of the total problem over the last 80, 90 years, you are not going to figure out the issue. And so I ended up in this condition as um, a bodybuilding champion. And I had competed at the Mr. Universe contest in 2003. And, you know, I got the pictures and I looked great and all that sort of stuff. And then after that contest, I gained 42 pounds of fat and water in 11 weeks. I went from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow. My digestive system was a wreck. I, uh, I was swollen and bloated. I had sleep apnea. My skin was breaking out. And I met a doctor, Dr. Michael O'Brien, who um, shared with me that he was able to overcome a debilitating condition of cirrhosis of the liver, as well as colon cancer, as well as helped Bernard Jensen overcome the, these issues and, and thousands of other clients from addressing digestive issues. He said, the problem with my program was that my digestive system had become compromised and he had devised a way to correct it. And when I did it, I corrected my digestive system. I got my health back, got my physique back. And then Matt and I started a company to start addressing this first with athletes, then at the holistic health clinic, because it turned out that what was causing problems with advanced athletes were also actually translatable into ordinary, you know, Joe and Janes in the regular public that in fact, oftentimes the Joe and Janes were experiencing the issue sooner or reporting it sooner because the athlete would just like, oh, wow, I'm suffering, or they would make the ridiculous adjustments in order to support their goals. And so over the course of four years, I think we coached 15,000 people and we worked out a, a, a variety of the parameters of how we correct people's digestive issues. And that led to the development of Bioptimizers Today, which first started as a digestive health company, but then kind of evolved into a health optimization overall. Because once you start to understand the problems, you start to say, oh, well, now we have magnesium def deficiency because of the nervous system is why people can't sleep or they can't relax or they're stressed out all the time. Or, or, or now we have neurochemical imbalances so people can't stay concentrated or aren't, access to, aren't accessing creativity the way they could. And so that's how our company came to a fruition over the last 17 years. Incredible. Oh my gosh. Wait, I have so many questions. I'm like trying to decide which route I want to go first. <laughs> I love everything you just said. Um, maybe we can start with the enzyme yes. part. So our, our pancreas is providing these digestive enzymes for our body, right? But like everything depends. you said, what was that? That depends. That depends. Okay. So yeah, I want to hear is... Are our pancreas is the issue? Is it all the other things you said that we're having trouble digesting in the first place? Do we all need to add enzymes? Is there any concern taking enzymes every day, long term? Great questions, all of them. And so <laughs> let's let's first discuss what an enzyme is. An enzyme okay. is a catalyst. It is the primary workforce of the body to turn one thing into something out to turn food into energy to turn a chemical reaction into something out it requires an enzyme there's over 25,000 different enzymatic processes in the body that's known and probably thousands more that are yet to be discovered the only two thing that really do does work in the body are enzymes and probiotics and probiotics are really bags of specific enzymes and bacteria in our body uh, probiotics, which we know as, and also bad bacteria, secrete various enzymes, which elicit responses in the body, which is the conversion of food or the breakdown of stuff or the development of biofilm. There's all the different cool things that these things do. And our body also manufactures enzymes. Most are manufactured in the liver and then stored and distributed by their gland. So for example, lipase enzymes would come out of the gallbladder, not so much out of the pancreas. Pancreas would deal with more with carbohydrates, uh, particularly, and so, so on and so forth. Um, for example, when people are looking at um, medications, they'll measure uh, what happens to liver enzymes to see how much toxicity a product is because your enzymes are part of the detoxification pathways inside the body or conversions inside your, your brain chemistry. And so 
what uh, the great pioneer Dr. Edward Howe determined back in the 30s and 40s and 50s is that all species on the planet actually eat an enzymatically rich diet. What that means is, is they eat their food in a live state. So zebras eat not just the protein, the fats and the carbohydrates or whatever is inside, a, you know, the zebra it takes down. It gets all of the enzymatic and bacteria culture with it because it eats it in a raw state. A bear with a salmon and a blueberry does the same thing. A horse or a cow that's eating grass. So whether it's a herbivore, an omnivore or carnivore, they're getting the, the enzymatic potential of that organism because they eat it in a live state. But humans are the only people that cook their food or we preserve our food because we'll dry it. We'll, we'll take it out of this enzymatically rich state so that it doesn't break down, rot and deteriorate. Why does that apple not rot in the store? Because it's been irradiated in the enzymes. So it is normal for humans and every other species to eat its food in a live enzymatically rich state. Now, there are advantages to cooking and I'm not here to dispute that. There's advantages to storing food, which is why humans have largely apart become the most dominant species. But there are consequences. There's always trade-offs to every advantage. There's no absolutes in nature. And the trade-off of civilization is, is that we give up the enzymatic potential of food. And that puts an extra enzymatic load on our body. In other words, our body has to manufacture enzymes. Now, our capacity to manufacture enzymes is limited. It's the enzyme potential. And thinking and walking and moving and repairing your body, all of this takes up that enzyme producing production capability inside your body. So the doctor will tell you, well, your body makes those enzymes. Yes, that's true. But I'll take people to what I call the turkey dinner syndrome. We all have Thanksgiving, Christmas, we pound up a lot of food and we have a second helping. Grandma breaks out the pie, all that stuff. And right afterwards, no one feels like going out and running a marathon, even though you ran a mar you got a marathon's worth of calories. So it's not a question that you don't have the food, the protein, the carbohydrates, the fats, whatever your preferred source of food or, or, or materials are, those are all present. Why do we feel tired and want to dive onto the couch or the floor and let drool down our house, pass out and wake up and go for another round? Well, what's going on there? Well, all of the enzymatic capacity is now being shunted from every other part of the body to go and break down this massive meal that we have. So what that means is brain says, well, we don't need them to think right now. We don't need to move right now. We don't need to repair right now. We have to break down, digest, utilize, store, do whatever we have with this massive meal. Over time, our capacity to manufacture, produce, and distribute enzymes diminishes. And this is what Hal pointed out in his enzyme nutrition. And he did extensive studies in a variety of species over multiple generations. He fed some enzymes, some out, no enzymes, and some, uh, he added enzymes to the diet and the results were fascinating. The species that's, that ate an enzymatically rich diet, their natural diet, they lived about to life expectancy. The ones that were enzymatically uh, augmented lived longer than the expected life expectancy. And the ones that were fed an enzyme deficient diet, not only did they not live as long, but multi-generationally, these enzyme deficiencies were passed down. In other words, by the third generation, all of the species lost the ability to procreate. They developed strange genetic diseases and sociological behaviors that were not normal for that species. And he predicted in the 40s and 50s that we would run into the same situation in humans. And if you look at social media, strange sociological behavior, if we look at the rise of fertility clinics, they're going up exponentially. And for the first time in the history of this country, the life expectancy for kids born today is lower than their parents. Yeah. So Crazy. people want to poo poo this enzyme thing, but the reality is this was predicted three generations ago and we're right on track to really creating damage to the human species and more importantly yeah. damage to the to do to, to the health the vitality and the happiness and if you look at the rates of depression for example they're skyrocketing out or out of control 
Yeah. And there's a variety of issues for that, but I do believe that there is some biochemical digestive reasons for that because I've seen those issues corrected when people address their digestive strength. Yeah. Interesting. So you mentioned dietary tribalism earlier. I think yes. we've started to villainize certain macronutrients and there's all these popular diet trends and people try them, they fail. Everyone has an opinion of what's right. Do you think ideally we should be able to eat anything and we're just putting our focus in the wrong place? Is healing the gut number one and our enzymes the number one part of that process? Because you see all these heal the gut programs out there. Are we missing the mark on that? I would say yes and maybe. <laughs> and, and the reason why I'm going to do that is because it's very hard to assess how much damage has been done over the generations over the last two, three generations. So it's very hard to say, you know, what a person today is digestive strength, bacteria, culture, variants, and capabilities from digestion is compared to our ancestors 80 years ago. Um, so that's hard to determine. Number two, it's hard to accurately assess what the quantity of a diet is, even if they're making the best choices. For example, I use a 11.5 pH water to wash my fruits and vegetables and I buy organic vegetables and I see a host of chemicals and agents and stuff come off those fruits and vegetables. So I'm spending top dollar over here at Ear One, you know, like the most expensive grocery store on the planet, I think. The most and fun yet, grocery store on the planet. Yeah, <laughs> the, the Disney I'm World still of grocery being stores. Subjected to a variety of chemicals that I may not be aware of. And those chemicals have metabolic consequences. And dietary tribalism happens because we as a species are going to adapt to environmental conditions. This is evolutionary biology. If you want to learn about that, follow Eric Weinstein. I think he's great. Him and his wife Heather do a great podcast and, and postulate these problems. Now, what's interesting is humans have now become the evolutionary agent of change, unlike what used to be environmental factors, you know, whether we're in the Northern Europe or we were in the plains, um, you know, or the, the Gobi Desert, or we were down in, you know, a high mountainous region. Really, these were the variants that we adapted over. Now, so for example, I see a lot of people advocating ketogenic diet, fat, in fact, Matt, my business partner is a ketogenic guy, and they cite a lot of um, natives of the north who lived on a high fat diet and had extraordinary levels of endurance and muscle mass. They also life expand was in the mid 30s. They forget to. So there's a lot of omission. There's a lot right. of raw food plant advocates. I was a complete raw foodie for a couple of years that will advocate the benefits. But if you look at the, a lot of the neurochemical issues that can happen for, um, I think neurological conditions associated with a, a low protein diet, there are some very significant issues there. And then you've got all the derivatives of that. Then there's the paleo crowd, for example, um, who are, if you look foundationally between the ketogenic, the paleo and the plant-based, what is the common element? Eat whole natural foods without chemical agents. Yes, but that may not be enough because if you're, for example, if, you're, if you've had damage to your lipolytic enzymes, say, which runs in my family, I have a variety of uh, family members who've had their gallbladders removed at an early age and don't digest fats very well. When any time that I would try a, a more ketogenic diet uh, early on in Matt and I's debates, I would get fat in my stools. It was very obvious that I would like, as soon as my fat hit a certain point, I wasn't digesting it. I didn't feel good. He feels amazing. But when he eats too many carbohydrates, he has a problem because he ate a lot of sugar as a kid. And so did his parents eat a lot of sugar and carbohydrates. So his carbohydrate digesting en enzyme pathways are damaged. So he feels better on a ketogenic diet. I feel better on a plant-based diet that's high in carbohydrate. Now, that being said, 
as an athlete, being on a plant-based diet was difficult. So I had to find extra ways to supplement, to support enough protein in my diet so that I didn't overeat and that I felt good in my brain. Mm -hmm. I also had to find specialized fats that weren't of a fish source in order to do that. And so there are nuances with any diet. And what happens is the dietary tribalism is like, oh, I'm a keto, oh, I'm a vigilante vegan, I'm a whatever, a carnivore. And they're fighting each other uh, not to get to the truth or not to find a more unified theory of nutrition. They're fighting to, to gain dominance and social credits within whatever hierarchy they find themselves so that they can bang their chest and feel good and write books about it. And a lot of now the current thing is like plants are trying to kill you is one of the trends that I find interesting. Um, and I find that laughable. But what I can say is, is there damage coming from these plants? And I think that that is legitimate, but is it coming from the plants themselves or is it coming from chemicals on the plants that people are digesting? And my suspicion is it's more the latter than the former. Yeah. So, so these yeah, are the nuances sense. that we have to address. And what, what, what bothers me is the average Joe and Jane who are approaching this dietary strategy are trying diets or they're going after it and thinking it's the Holy grail but it's really low resolution thinking that is going to discourage them and they're going to fail on their diet. They're going to fail on their system and they're going to give up because it seems like nobody knows what's going on and nobody understands me and I can't seem to get this right. And so Matt and I are releasing a book next year on this whole topic. I was editing on it this morning. We're going to solve this for the, for the, for the world. Cause it's been my mission for the last 20 plus years and we're, we're excited to do that. So I love it. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting. It's, it's kind of our magnus opus. And, and Matt and I, we, I mean, we've gone at it. I mean, we're at the opposite. I mean, he goes carnivore sometimes. I go full raw food. So we, we, you know, we couldn't be more polar and we couldn't be more unified in how we address the underlying issues to, to resolve these for people. And that's our modus yeah. operandi. That's so powerful yeah. as a team to have opposite ends of the spectrum, but be unified in your fundamental approach. Well, this is the part that got lost somewhere in social media in that the, the idea of, of open dialogue and debate between people was not to create a dominance of one person's opinions over another. It was to have the opposing argument um, help you rethink holes within your strategy and vice versa so that both people could come to a more unified version of what might be closer approximation of truth. And mm -hmm. somehow that got into, you know, um, my way or the highway, F you, you're a loser, you know, in, in 110 characters, whatever they do on all these events. And then, you know, and then now it's, now we wave the banners of tribalism and, <laughs> you know, these pe the, 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 the vegan knights are, you know, are attacking the carnivore of carnivorians and all those sorts of, it's like it's like oh my god it's so it's crazy it's, well it's people incredible. like answers people don't like to not have an answer or a solution but that's not really the way that science works it's kind of open-ended and we have to keep asking why and keep asking questions so how do we guide people into keeping an open mind well this is where i think is why the fundamental reason why biohacking has emerged and you ladies are on the forefront of this. And that is being able to take the individual, run a variety of tests because testing has now come down that you can do it on an individual basis and start picking off things that are propensities and liabilities within that video, their genetics, their epigenetics, their microbiome, their blood markers, you know, these things that were not available to the consumer even 10 years ago, some, some of them not even five years ago, yeah. now you can see, you can run a continuous glucose monitor. You can find out what the bacteria are inside your gut. You can see what your ancestors would do best on or your epigenetical response would be on things. And then you can add the element of supplementation that is addressing the holes in whatever dietary strategy that you find right for you that you can address the, um, the variants within your own digestive system so that you can optimize your digestive system 
for health and vitality and immune response, but also specific to the diet that you have. And then you can run a spectrum test and say, oh, guess, you know what, you know what, I'm missing this and this and I have a trouble absorbing that. So now I can go to the store and I can strategically select the supplements I need to augment and I can engage in practices that are going to be right for me to get me to where I want to go so that I optimize my system. And I do believe to, to go full circle from the original question is that I believe that the goal should to become so bulletproof and Teflon coated that you could survive and thrive on just about any diet. I am quite confident that should I decide to, I could move to a ketogenic diet. I could move to a carnivore diet. I could do to a paleo diet. I just prefer this one and have gone as deep and as far as I can to optimize this, to kind of share that perspective with the world for those who want it. Yeah. I love, I that. love that. I love that. Yeah. Listen, I think listen up, Mr. Saladino. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have to take the bio individual component into that. And yeah, I think I would love to be bulletproof and just be able to fight off anything be flexible be flexible yes yeah. And, yeah. and that is it you know the big um you know charles I, I love this they always say the survival of the the fittest in darwinism but if you actually go into that book and read it most people don't most people just grab the snippets of thing charles darwin didn't say that darwin said it's the most adaptable species in his famous blue-footed booby bird program, mm. which was an adaptable species. And so what, what biohackers, I think, are sharing is they're the most adaptable species aspects of the human species. And biohacking is not just adapting to biological technology or nutritional technology, but they're using um, digital technology, testing technology, chemical, like a all these other agents that are now part of the modern world to reverse engineer and optimize our health and what we call our biospan, which is our healthy lifespan. Yeah. And so, you know, we're running a bunch of experiments right now on, on, on uh, homo sapiens. And I think it's over for homo sapiens. I think it's going to be homo something else. And I think the, the evidence in people aren't recognizing that There's, was it's homo geneticus or homo artificial intelligentus or uh, homo cyborganus or some other version of those two things or genetic some kind of hybrid. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, MIT came out with a major paper the other day on the infusion and synchronization between artificial intelligence and humans, which many of the people are going, which is they're talking about a single solitary unit of artificial intelligence and human fusion which is called the singularity but now they're coming out and and we don't know what the impacts of that be what happens if we hit a solar flare and it knocks out all the electronics 100 years from now which happened in the 1860s which burnt down all the telegraph terminals around the world well if everybody's connected on chips and electronics and we're all dialed into the net and then all of a sudden a big solar flare comes and fries everybody what's left I'll tell you what's left Ooh. The people who are living in uh, tribal like spheres because big cities, everybody will die relatively quickly. Yeah. Living yeah. off the land, using solar, yeah. Yeah. Grow growing their own food. Yeah. 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 So to circle back to what you found works best for you, I know you're big on practice intuition as we are. And we find with our clients, it's really hard. It takes a lifetime to develop that intuition. Yes. How did you find that for yourself? And how did you come to realize other than not digesting fats well, that vegetarianism was best for you? Like what, do, what can people look out for? What should they feel? What are some clues? Great questions. So the first thing that you want to do, and this is so crude and so effective. Is get one of these, it's called a pen and paper and a journal. <laughs> and you write- When the tech what, goes out, we still have it. Well, you write down what you eat. And then you write down how you feel. And I used to get my clients to do that for, you know, uh, for a week or two. And they all say, oh, how do you, I'd say, how do you eat? And they'd say, well, I eat pretty good. I'm like, well, write that down for a week. And they'd come back slunking with their shoulders. Like, how did that go? And they're like, well, I, I guess I don't eat as good as I thought I did. So that's first is you need to understand where you're at. It's probably worse than you think. 
The second, when you write down not just what you eat, but how you feel, you start to notice there's patterns. And we can't remember what we did on Monday. So, or three days ago, or four days ago, or what we ate or whatever. So by writing it down, we start to see patterns within this. Now, some people will use a continuous glucose monitor to see, you know, I saw, was it January AI can now, after four days of diet, predict your blood sugar response 33 hours in advance. It's wow. nuts. Okay. Wow. But you can start doing this and seeing patterns. And then someone who is a coach such as yourself is going to start recognizing patterns. Oh, you're tired at three o'clock or you're, uh, ang- you have anxiety early in the morning, or you feel draggy, or you feel hyper energized or whatever it happens to be. And then you do that. And that gives you your first baseline. And so when you make dietary change, you implement the change and then you continue to track and see what happens. So, and then if, when, when you want to incorporate more advanced technology where it's, you know, you know, all the different tests that you can do, which are increasing exponentially, you want to tie what you eat with how you feel with the data that you're producing. So over time, you are going to be able to know what the data says by how you feel. I was able to determine this because I lived in the middle of the woods and there was no one around and there was no technology and I had to get really granular about my own self. And then my coach who helped me guide this and I think being a bodybuilder, you get really dialed into your physicality, your muscle, like you know the contraction of muscles, how your muscles feel, how your body feels, how digestion feels, how your brain feels. And, and I guess I just got really good at this. Uh, so much so today I can walk, and, and this sounds pretty freaky. I can walk into a grocery store or like a nutrition store and I can walk by the aisle and I will feel my attention be drawn and I'll be like, what's this product? And uh, I think a lot of people totally underestimate the power of their unconscious awareness. And if you dial yeah. it, you get really, really into it. And I think that we are entering into an age where research is now demonstrating that our intuitive capacities are far greater and expansive than was originally thought. And that's what's, I think, most exciting for me. Yeah, I think people definitely have it in them. It's just this bombardment of whatever the EMFs, all the dopamine stimulation, all these things, if we can clear that out. I think we can be more intuitive. And I love what you said about the journal. So uh, funny story, when I was 10 years old, I had crazy stomach problems, like horrible stomach pain. It would come out of nowhere. And my parents even took me to Johns Hopkins. They ran all the tests. There was nothing wrong. So the dietitian there said, why don't you start keeping a notebook, right? Everything you eat right when you get the stomach pain, it was not food related. It was anxiety. The stomach pain was before school before dance class, before an exam, and just by pen and paper. After probably thousands of dollars of testing at Johns Hopkins, it was the pen and paper that figured it out. Yeah, and you're lucky you weren't put on medications as most people are. They're just like, I don't know what the answer is. I'll I'll take a bottle of something. Well, that's what's happened over the last 80 years is the pharmaceutical intervention towards dietary issues has become so prevalent that people are now looking, hey, what pill do I need? As opposed to taking ownership of the problem. And the New England Journal of Medicine says that they are not in the business of of curing disease, that they treat the symptoms of. And we as practitioners and as um, citizens of the world have to recognize that the responsibility for our health and our vitality does not rest upon the shoulders of our doctor or on the shoulders of our government or the lobbyist groups in uh, big corporations that benefit from that. It rests firmly on our own shoulders. And whatever challenges that one has and experiences lie the seeds of incredible discovery and opportunity. And so I believe that our obstacles become the foundations of our future. And that means it is an invitation from divinity to let us know that there is something that we need to know and we need to pay attention to. And if we don't, it comes back in greater intensity and frequency until we figure it out or 
we suffer so much, we choose not to be here anymore. Mm. Yeah. I think the suffering can be a good push for us to figure it out. Well, you know, that was our mission statement. Our mission statement in the company was to end physical suffering and activate biologically optimized health. Mm. And, you know, over the years, I think we've, we're now into, uh, you know, well over a hundred thousand people, which we've been able to help end suffering and move towards optimal health. And whether it's the courses that we offer, the, the supplements we offer, the education materials, the, the podcast, it's all driving to make a difference in the world because frankly, there's nothing that gets me more jacked up than seeing somebody that has suffered and we were able to provide a solution or direct them to a solution. And then we get that testimonial back and they said, oh, my life is so much better. I'm hanging out with my grandkids mm -hmm. or I can now go play bridge with my friends and not have to worry about disaster pants or whatever. And it's like, you know, th these are really real things yeah. that, um, you know, impair people's health. And I'm, um, I'm so passionate. About it. I mean, I read every single complaint and all of our testimonials and I answer all of the questions that come into the company and I have for 17 years for that reason. Yeah. Well, we can so see cool. and hear your passion for sure. Every time you speak, we can tell. Yeah. I I love it's it. amazing. It's um, wait, I have, I have a question back to the protein issue. Can we talk about protein bioavailability? Cause I've heard like, if we eat say like eggs or chicken, our body's really only using like 30% of the protein in that. And I know and if you're eating plant-based, how do you get your protein and how do the enzymes in the HCL increase the bioavailability? Great question. And so there were two major developments about this protein bioavailability. There's the BV in protein efficiency ratio, the PER, which is determining of how many amino acids and are in that front, which I find funny because they talk about uh, humans have a variety of essential amino acids that we don't produce and we need to get it from our food. But all plants can contain all those essential amino acids. So the idea that plants are incomplete proteins, I don't think is accurate. In fact, they're very complete because they provide all the essential amino acids that we don't manufacture and our body can manufacture the, the amino acids that we don't. What typically happens with plants, though, is that we don't get sufficient enough. And I do believe part of that is because of factory farming over the last 80 years has depleted the protein content. And I'm indicating that because in 1900, there was a study in um, it was a report in uh, the U.S. Congress about the degradation of wheat protein. Protein at that time was around 90% in wheat, and now it's less than 7%. And if you look at most of the food, it will, if it's been grown conventionally and monoculture farming and use of chemicals and agents and stripping away, you, what, what happens is your body will convert the protein in the plant into enzymes to grow the plant and make the plant grow. And over time, you diminish the strength and weaknesses. This is problems that is happening with everything from hybrid marijuana plants that become no longer reproduced to um, things like wheat. For example, people will have wheat in North America. They can't eat it. They got gluten problems. They can't digest it. They go to Italy. They eat past every day and feel great because it's actually different types of wheat. We're not running the same stuff. We're running multi-generational problems. Almost all superfood, which contains high amounts of amino acids and essential nutrients and phytonutrients are because guess what? It's been growing in a jungle or a forest or a mountain and hasn't been subject subjected to mass farming production. If you go to a Mennonite farm where they've been producing, you know, potatoes and apples and tomatoes and all that sort of stuff for years, you eat one tomato and you're like, I'm full. Well, why? Because the nutrient density, the protein con, everything is way higher than what you would get on your grocery store shelf, even if you're biting premium food, such as I do. So we have to recognize first and foremost, that it probably was easier to get everything we needed from plants 80, 90, hundred years ago, not happening. Same thing with our meat produce production. And so I want to kind of go the opposite way. So I address both issues with our, our, when we're using meat produced in kind of the factory farms and they're fed tremendous amounts of antibiotics and preservatives and dyes and chemicals are in the food and all these other agents that shouldn't be there. 
the quality of that food is very different than, you know, if you're out getting some wild game out, you know, in the, in the North somewhere like you're hunting elk and, you know, none of it. Well, it's going to be different. And so what is food is not really food. What we call food is not really food. So our definition of food needs to be re readjust. But now when it comes to plants, in order to absorb your protein, and you not it's not protein you need, it's actually amino acids. And your ability to convert protein into amino acids depends on a multi-phase proteolytic activity in the body that, that handles all the pH levels, 6.0, 4.5, 3.0, and the variance between it, most in that 6.0 range. Number two, how much hydrochloric acid you produce, because hydrochloric acid is an essential part of breaking out those bonds as well as changing the pH. And then the bacteria present that has an ability to digest and convert the uh, remaining amino acids or proteins into the amino acids that your body needs or the polypeptide chains or whatever happens and produce. Those three factors are going to determine the end result. So there's what you eat and then how well you convert what you eat into the building blocks that you mm -hmm. need. Many people who go to a specific type of dieting, such as a plant-based diet, like, like I did, is often because the, the restriction of, of eating a plant diet is giving you advantages in the initial, because maybe you were getting too toxic from meat or seafood, or you weren't able to digest fats or whatever. So you have to realize is you went to that diet in the first place because you were compromised, but never addressed the compromise. And so that compromise stayed with you. And you kind of got the benefits of, of alleviating the inflammatory products, but you never ident identified or addressed the deficiencies. And you get the vegetarian that comes down, you know, after five, six, seven, eight years and like, oh my God, I, my menstrual cycle was off or my brain didn't work right. And then I started eating the organ meats and I got supercharged and I felt good. Well, no, you had that problem going beforehand. And so those can be addressed if you know systematically how to do it. And the first step is fix your digestion. And it's why it's the foundation of our, our philosophy beyond air, water, exercise, and sunlight, which are non-negotiable. That's the first formula of the, if you don't get those things, forget, forget the diet. And then <laughs> we look at enzymes, probiotics, hydrochloric acid, um, essential minerals, essential fatty acids, essential amino acids, and herbs as the foundational components that the diet is to compose of and whatever is missing within that say plant-based diet or, you know, carnivore diet or whatever, we can address systematically using biohacking tests to now we've got our digestive system working. Now we see what weaknesses are. We can augment those in through supplementation or minor dietary adjustments so that we get those things and we can convert those things into what we need. So mm. when I started out, I was eating, uh, somewhere around 250 grams of protein a day on, uh, you know, when I started this out and on a plant-based diet, that's, that's virtually impossible. So you have to do kind of a lacto ovo kind of diet to make that in. And still I, I, I felt terrible. It didn't work right. I, might, I couldn't break down this food. When I started using enzymes, probiotics and hydrochloric acid, I got my protein content down to 75 to hundred grams per day. Wow. And was able wow. to compete at a world championship level in bodybuilding without augmenting with uh, steroids, which cr create um, steroids produce extra proteins in your body. That's part of the, how they augment and why a lot of athletes use them because you can build more muscle tissue. You can also increase contractile strength. So how was I able to do that? Because I fixed my digestion, was able to get more out of those 85 grams than maybe someone else who had, you know, normal, quote unquote, normal digestion, which isn't normal, eating 250 grams. And so, and even to this day, right now, I'm doing my 50 weeks to 50. I mean, I eat um, one serving of my protein product, which is three different types of, of proteins from hemp from pumpkins and from pea, do that once a day. And the, the other three meals, I just have beans. And, you know, I'm now into single digit body fat levels. I'm almost 50 years old and uh, feel great. So it's amazing. I couldn't do that without the digestive aids. And I take enzymes before every meal. I take hydrochloric after my meals and I take uh, 
various types of probiotics to augment my microbiome. So Amazing how do you know how many to take? I've, I've heard that you've taken hundreds of enzymes in a day and there's no yeah. toxic limit. How do we know how to start titrating? What's yeah, like an great optimal question. Dose? For most meals um, on, a, on a high, on a, on a high uh, what I would say, proteolytic enzymes are going to be the number one thing that people are deficient in. That's what I've noticed. And why I know this is because if you look at athletic performance, which is determinant on your ability to convert protein into amino acids to repair damage, you do not find athletes over the age of 28 years old in professional sports that improve. In other words, the damage from their training or their sport and running backs is a great idea that almost none of them actually get better after that age. They cannot recover from the damage. And, and that's about the time that proteolytic enzyme production starts to drop off mm. and athletes will tell you, they just can't recover. They're more sore. They can't get back. When I take more proteolytic enzymes, my ability to recover improves and increases. And so I can scale that up and, and, and hijack the system by increasing my capability for the average individual. Um, usually one to five enzymes, depending on how much digestive distress they're experiencing. I would also say um, there's a couple of interesting tests that you can do to find out if you're deficient and this won't cost you anything. You can take after a meal, if you find that you feel bloated or full or that sort of stuff, take uh, two tablespoons of lemon juice. If you find that alleviates the system, you're deficient in enzymes. Um, if you want to find out if you're deficient in hydrochloric acid, you can take a um, half teaspoon of baking soda, mix it in four ounces of water and drink it down. If you burp within five minutes, you make enough hydrochloric acid. If you don't, you're not producing enough. And then for bacteria, you can just do uh, like a gut map or a biome test or something like that to see if there's any bacteria. And then you can overlay that over uh, genetics or epigenetic, some, you've got someone that can read the epigenetics and see what bacteria cultures or what predisposition type foods, because you might be able to break down protein, say from fish or from chicken really well, but not from beef or not from lamb. Like, you know, you don't know those variances and that, that'll determine that. So it's not just how much protein you're eating. It's the source of protein relative to what you break down and digest, absorb and utilize. And so for me, um, I find that somewhere between usually on average, about three enzymes will wipe out everything. Some people find that one is good. And some people like to have five. I'm a little bit excessive. That's why I have an enzyme company. I, I eat them like they're going <laughs> unlimited in. enzymes. Yeah. And there's another thing that a lot of people don't recognize is that if you take enzymes on an empty stomach, they do elicit metabolic and systemic effects. Um, I've seen people's scars heal. I see improvement in cognitive function, improved energy, recovery, all these different things. Whatever the deficient area is, oftentimes those enzymes will start to go and correct that on empty stomach. So I do advocate for people who have digestive issues, spend 90 days, go at it hard, take your enzymes, your hydrochloric acid probiotics. We give you those issues. We give you, we share with people how to do that. After the 90 days, titrate down on a meal to meal basis so that you get yourself dialed in for you. Hydrochloric acid, interesting enough, when um, you take enough of it over time, it seems after two or three months that your body will start producing it. I talked to Paul Check about that the other day. I said, what do you suppose that is? And he suggested it's because it beats down the um, contraindicative bacteria that often leads to uh, acid reflux and heart uh, heartburn, which is really common elements. And so mm -hmm. when you wipe out those guys, then your body returns back to back. hydrochloric acid production. That's something I've noticed for people. So usually HCL is the one that you don't need that long. Enzymes are something that I think is beneficial long-term because we don't get it in our food and it's natural to all species. And probiotics, you would normally get on the food associated with what you eat because they would be present on the food, but now that's eradicated. So taking a little bit of probiotics a day is a good proaction and uh, choose it right for your diet. Awesome. Amazing. Great. Tips. I love the free test. Really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One more supplement question. Magnesium. Yes. Are most people deficient in it? Is this a I big think, problem? I, I, I think there's almost no one that isn't. And, 
And the reason that is, is the, the North American soil has been deficient in magnesium for many, many years. And our diets are also um, highly enriched with calcium. And magnesium and calcium exist in about a two to one ratio in that uh, we've concentrated on magnesium or calcium for strong bones. And what happens if you take more calcium in and you throw off that magnesium calcium ratio, what happens is your body will actually start dumping more minerals. Now, mineral density, your bone density is determined of a lot of things and is very indicative for longevity and health. Um, it's also indicative for proper heart function, blood flow regulation, and also the alleviation of muscle cramps and the reduction of anxiety related issues. And electromagnetic frequencies actually increase the, the need for magnesium in the body. So staring into blue light, being in Wi-Fi, and there's a variance between individuals of how much that's going to impact them. But it's safe to say that in the highly technologically Wi-Fi, you know, 5G world that we're living in with all these frequencies, that that's putting a tax on our, um, you know, we have these little channels, these aquaporin channels where water goes in and outside of the, the tissues, which are going on these uh, calcium, magnesium channels and potassium. And it's, this is really cool cycles. I won't get into all the details, but what happens is we just don't have enough magnesium run and we start feeling anxious. So we feel that, you know, we take caffeine and we feel, oh, I'm kind of crazy. You know, the ride up for the first thing. <laughs> Good. And after that, you're yelling at everybody and stuff. And that's a good into, or I can't sleep at night. And so there's different types of magnesium that address different components inside the body or have been shown in different studies. And so what we did is we started testing all these different types of magnesium to see which one elicited different effects based on the research. And we realized that the best way to address it was develop magnesiums that addressed all of the deficient strains to get an, uh, a synergistic effect. And we did. And I think that's become one of the best magnesium supplements around the world. We get so many great testimonials from it. And it's phenomenal. No one else is producing and selling anything like it. Yeah. It's the cool. seven, the seven strains is pretty phenomenal. And I think it's just such a huge myth. A lot of people will take mag citrate and they're like, Oh, it affects my bowels. I'm not going to take magnesium anymore. That didn't help my problems. And then they stop right there. What about Correct. all the other ones? Yeah. Correct. So, you know, whether it's, I mean, citrate will draw more water into the intestines and there's like bisglycinate, there's um, malitate, orotate, threonate. I mean, you can get all these different things. And basically it's just the bond with the protein and then where that gets absorbed and utilized by the body. And so um, when you get into it, it becomes really fascinating inside the body. And uh, we just added a uh, sucrosomial uh, which is a fat soluble, which is even more absorbable form of magnesium. So you can take higher and higher dosages. Most people can take anywhere from three to five grams a day if they're deeply deficient. And that's usually when they're having anxiety issues and sleep disorders and things like that. And I'm not saying it treats anxiety. I'm going to be careful about making any legal or medical <laughs> claims, but, um, it's a noticeable difference. People take that before they go to bed, they sleep better, they recover better, they don't have the muscle issues. And it's, it's fascinating to watch. And by the way, we give just so people know, we, we give 100% money back guarantees on any supplement that we sell. We put a lot of education with it. We do videos to show you how to do it. We give you reports, our customer service is all really well trained to answer your questions. And if they can't answer the question, that question goes to me and I answer the question about how to take, utilize and try the product. And if for any reason it doesn't, it's not like the best thing that you ever had before, great. Let us know, we just give you your money back and you know, go take another test because we're into this biohacking thing together. I think it's the only way humans are gonna survive in a technologically advanced world. And that's why it's so great to be on your guys' show because you guys are on the tip of the spear. Oh man, we appreciate it so much. The education that you're putting behind us, you're not just selling a product. Obviously you have such a knowledge base and you're really making it personalized because that's something I see in the supplement industry. No one is personalized. No one is giving the tools to figure out what do you need? It leaves with people yeah. with cabinets full of crap and probably worse off than they felt before. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. Your video series is amazing. Oh, I mean, thank you. just great. And I love that it just like drops information in your email, in your inbox every day. Yep. So and now they can get it on the app. 
You can, oh, you, okay. Yeah, we have a Bioptimizer app so that you can scroll cool. through it and rate, watch it on your phone. Really simple. It's really awesome. So people can kind of pick the thing they want. And I didn't, I want to make a caveat. It's not like I came up with all these ideas. I just collected all the best ideas and put it into one systematic philosophy so people could go into the world and, and say, okay, here's the, here's first principles. I got to get my breathing down. I got to get my water figured out. I got to do an exercise program that, that works for me. I need to expose myself to light and reduce artificial lighting as much as possible. Then we can get into the dietary stuff and the supplementation part. Not until you get those big movers out of the way first. And then you go into these things. And now when you add that one element, you add that magnesium or you add that probiotic or hydrochloric. Now it's a force multiplier because you've got all of the foundational points in, and then you get turbocharged. And that's when you become a crazy biohacker like us and you get all <laughs> jacked up and you go to the conferences and high five and yeah. you know. hugging and squeezing everybody in sight. Exactly. Yeah, look how strong and vibrant I am. <laughs> <laughs> I see that in our near future. <laughs> all going to yes. see each other next week. You got oh, it. Oh gosh. Can't wait. wait. You're incredible. I feel like we could dive into so many other topics here, but we're going to wait for our inbox to be flooded with requests to have you back. So <laughs> I'd love to have you back on the show sometime. Sounds great. Thanks so Before much. Before we let you go, if you could give our audience one piece of advice, something they can start doing today to optimize their health, wellness, mind, spirit, yeah. anything. That is um, Sal people always have goals or dreams or visions of what they want to look like or why that is. Um, but I was actually just editing this on a chapter today. And that is you need to tie your emotions to your goals. Um, and what that means is, is why do you want to look this way? Why do you want to feel this way? What are the consequences if you don't who are the people that are going to benefit your friends, your family, your spouse? What's it going to be like to have that new form of confidence or that level of vitality or energy and charge that up with a much emotion? The mind side of this thing has been figured out by all these PhDs and scientists and everything else. But the human element is to amplify and anchor our emotional state with that which what we are trying to go for or achieve or, or overcome. And the strength and the repetitiveness of that emotional energy will allow it to sustain, to change the behavior so that you get to where you want to go, as well as to have enough juice to overcome whatever obstacle you have on the way. And so I think there's a tremendous amount of knowledge in the world today and not enough recognition of the emotional energy which connects all of us as humans. You know, mind is the directional force, but uh, heart is what amplifies the wave. And so to put your heart into things and your emotion and your passion and your energy is what will bring you home over the long run. And I encourage everybody to go out and express and, and anchor that as deep as they can in their goals as they get a more healthier person. I love it. Incredible. Love your, incredible. Yeah. I love your energy and passion. We're just so grateful for you, Wade, and cannot wait to see you next week. We're going to Bulletproof. Yay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be amazing. Superhuman energies coming. You got it. Coming. You got yeah. it. Lots of, lots of optimized humans. I love your oh, hat. Man. Thank Hashtag you. Optimize human. We'll see, we'll see if we can get you one of those. I mean, come by the booth early. They'll probably go soon, but you know, oh, okay. We got me some of those. <laughs> we'll be there All first. Right, thing. For those of you that can't wait, meet Wade in person, we're going to send you to his website by Optimizers. We'll make sure you have all the good resources so you can dig into this a little bit more. Wade, thank you so much for spending your time with us and sharing so much knowledge. I, I want to go to Wade T. Lightheart School and learn more. <laughs> Thanks so much. Great to be here and I uh, can't wait to see you next week. Yeah. And thanks to everyone that tuned in today. We'll see you next time.